Hey, it's Bobby Sylvester, and we've got an episode for you today about risky players with Matt Camp of BleacherReport.com. But first, I want to tell you about a website that's going to make your fantasy football life a lot easier this season, TeamStake.com. If you're tired of hassling family and friends for league dues, TeamStake makes it super easy and convenient for you. They have a fully customizable pay-in and payout distribution system. The site is super easy to navigate, and best of all, it's free. Please check out TeamStake.com. I've used them last year. And I couldn't be more pleased, so I'll definitely be back. Again, that's TeamStake.com. All right, let's talk some football. Welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast with Mike Tagliere, and I'm Bobby Sylvester. Tags, we got to see some football last night, man. What's going on? We did. We got to see some Blaine Gabbert. And, uh, you know, I posted something on Twitter last night saying that uh, I know it's just preseason. I know it's the first game. And I know I know all this stuff, right? But Blaine Gabbert actually looked really good. And, you know, people are taking away. They're like, Mike, he was playing against second stringers and this and that. That's not the point. You're missing the point if, if you think that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about he stood tall in the pocket. He was poised. He he had zip on the ball. Like, there, there was a whole lot to take away from that. I don't really care that it was 20-plus yard gains, like, left and right. It's more about like, you know, his posture and everything he was going through. And, you know, a Completely lot of people start- different player. Yeah. A lot of people started mentioning that Bruce Arians just has has this effect on quarterbacks, you know, that he he's going to get the best out of him. So, if, you know, if, I know that he's like, teased us in the past and things like that, but it, it was definitely a sign. Uh, I mean, a good sign for a resurgence in, in his career is to maybe a backup quarterback. So today we're going to be chatting about risky players that we're willing to take a chance on and some that we're not willing to take a chance on. Our guest is Matt Camp of BleacherReport.com. You can find him on Twitter at the Matt Camp. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us, guys. I really am excited to talk about uh, two great quarterbacks, Blaine Gabbert, which we just got into, <laughs> uh, Bobby killing it at Dave and Buster's last night. So <laughs> this is really the true start of the football season and the preseason. Uh, by the way, I totally agree with you on Blaine Gabbert. I was watching that game without my wife last night. I didn't have the sound on. I'm looking around and go, wait, I didn't think Carson was playing. Wait, is that Blaine Gabbert? Man, he's really <laughs> slinging it out there. That's the guy that Jacksonville thought they'd get like five or six years ago. But yeah, I thought he looked okay. But then again, I'm reminding myself, oh, he's playing in Canton. And that's the last time we'll mention Blaine Gabbert and Canton in the same sense. <laughs> I've, uh, you know, I never thought I'd be mentioned in the same sentence with Blaine Gabbert. Like my career <laughs> must be going downhill quick. But yeah, I'll take it after the way he played last night. So anyway, we got a really good question. I know we've got some news of the week, but we got a great question in the listener mailbag, and that's mailbag at fantasypros.com. This one's about bye weeks. Weeks six, eight, and nine this year are brutal, especially eight. And what he says is he's been doing some mock drafts, and he's been going and getting David Johnson almost every time um, when he drafts from the first or second pick. But then he sees Murray, Gurley, or Fournette a lot. And they have the same bye weeks. So would you be hesitant to pair up your bye weeks for your number one and number two running backs? Or is that maybe the way to go? That wouldn't scare me because it's one week. I mean, that's how I think of it. It's one week. Even with my best players in the lineup, I could lose in any given week. That's what fantasy football is. So I'm not going to sacrifice the thought of losing one week or not having my best players for one week. By the way, assuming that they're even going to be healthy at that time of the year at the running back position, we can never assume that Uh, if it's if it's sacrificing what I think is going to make for a better team for the rest of the season. uh, One week does not scare me. The only time I think that comes up is when you're in best ball leagues, maybe the quarterback position. You got to avoid those uh, bye weeks because you want to put some points on the board there. But in in terms of your typical redraft and any other league, auction league, anything like that, I, I do not get worried at all by bye weeks. I mean, when David Johnson's out, you're probably going to lose anyway, right? Right. You might as well just plan on losing that week. And I'm I'm not saying you go into your draft planning to get all by week eight guys. Like, you you don't do that kind of thing. It would completely screw over your draft. With that being said... If you can do it, that would really help. You just lose one game and you've got a big advantage the rest of the time. Yeah, I'm with Matt. I don't I don't pay attention to bye weeks when drafting a redraft squad. Uh, I know that one year, like some of my league mates pointed out to me that they're like, Mike, how many players are on your roster that were on your roster the day we drafted? And at the end of the season, there was three. Three of the 18 players that I drafted were on my team. So I, I definitely do a lot of moves throughout the season. And honestly, if you can, if like if they, they fall in line with each other, that's perfect. You know, take a loss one week and move on. You don't have to worry about this week I'm missing this guy and this 
this week. I'm missing this guy. You know, ideally, they're all in one week. Matt Matt said it best. He took the words right out of my mouth. And best ball, you can't do that because best ball adds your best score from each week and every single week counts. So you can't just have everybody stacked. So it's something I pay attention to in best ball. But when you're talking about redraft, don't even pay attention to the bye weeks. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing none of us here draft backup quarterbacks. So I... Again, that's something I wouldn't pay attention to, so just avoid it. Don't even think about it. All right, Tag. So uh, we've had a lot of news this week. What do you want to talk about here? We have. I think we have to start. Uh, the biggest news, I think, is Ryan Tannehill. You know, yesterday he pulled up limp. It was a non-contact injury. Hits his left knee, the one that he chose not to have surgery on last offseason. Instead, he hits the stem cell treatment. Uh, and now they're saying that he's avoided structural damage. But at the same time, it seems like like minimal. He's going to miss six to eight weeks. And even from even from then, it, it could turn into a longer time. So it seems like this is a very you know dark situation, one that it's not likely to be resolved anytime soon. So my question to you guys what does this do for the pass catchers? A, if Matt Moore is the quarterback and they just kind of go forward with him and sign a veteran backup, or what does it do if they brought in Cutler or Colin Kaepernick? You know, Matt, let's start with you. What would you, what would it do for this offense? Would you downgrade players because they don't have Ryan Tannehill? Or is there a particular quarterback that you'd like to see brought in? Or do you think Matt Moore is competent? I don't think the quarterback is really going to be much of an upgrade no matter who they bring in. I think Matt Moore is fine. Cutler, we know, is going to take his chances. I don't necessarily feel great about that right now. I'd rather this kind of be a boring offense, which at times it was last year, but it was good for the Dolphins, and it was pretty solid for fantasy and very good for J.J. He's been the missing component of that offense uh, since Ryan Tannehill's been there, a competent, reliable singular running back that they haven't had really a single a, a ground game that they haven't had so when I look at that offense and and what it's going to be without Ryan Tannehill I, I just want someone that's going to keep them on schedule and I don't think Adam Gase is going to want to bring in a Jay Cutler who by the way he hasn't had an offseason he's been getting ready to do broadcasting I mean this I, I, and I know he's a pro and naked yeah, that too. I mean, <laughs> but that's what that, that's the thing. That's what we know Jay Cutler by everything but football this offseason. And I know he can walk in tomorrow and probably be, uh, you know, competent as a quarterback. But Matt Moore knows what the offense is. Kaepernick, look, I, I think there's something there to that. I think there's uh, a little bit of juice there and what he brings to the table. I think he is ready to go. All the stuff we've heard about him is that, you know, while he's doing all this great work, he is preparing. He wants to play football. That is evident. So yeah. I, I, I don't know. If it's six to eight weeks, I think they just stand pat with Matt Moore. That brings us to the wide receivers. Jarvis Landry's fine. He's a very solid wide receiver, too. Uh, a little bit more maybe than that in, in PPR formats. I think we know that. He's their most reliable guy. And then, you know, I think we've been waiting on Devontae Parker to make this jump, and, and it really just hasn't happened. And you see the ADP difference between Parker and, and Kenny Stills, and it continues to kind of surprise me where Parker's going as a wide receiver right around 37 in PPR, and, and Kenny Stills is down at 64. And these guys have had comparable numbers, at least last year they did. And, and people are just waiting for this jump to happen with Devontae Parker, and I don't want to assume that's going to happen. We know that part of Tannehill's problem – has been a consistent deep ball. He, he's got a nice arm, and I think he plays the quarterback position well and has gotten better, but those deep ball stats have not always been great for him, and I think that's part of Parker's game. We know that's definitely part of Kenny Stills' game, and I, I just think they're too similar, so to see Parker take that next step, losing his quarterback, is going to concern me that much more. I think he's going too high as it is. People are projecting him to be a, a player that they hope him to be, and I, I just don't know if it's going to happen in this offense, especially if Tannehill at minimum is going to miss six to eight weeks. So I think it keeps Landry about at the same spot. He's their most reliable player. Jay Ajayi now from the running back standpoint, I think becomes an even bigger part of the offense if Tannehill is going to miss significant time. I'm not super high on Ajayi anyway. Uh, as we saw last year, consistency. He had really big games and then also had some very quiet games in there. And I know where he finished on the season and where he's getting drafted, but I wanted to see more consistency. I know we had, you know, the big weeks, but he had four top 15 finishes last year, just four of them. Uh, that is a concern to me for a player who's being drafted in the top 10. So this puts him under the magnifying glass that much more with Tannehill out of the mix. So this is a concern to me. Uh, I don't think they should go out and go get anybody. If they just want to kind of keep things on schedule, I think you stick, stick, stick with Matt Moore. Now, if they need 
and, and, and need a quarterback and need to say, all right, Tannehill's out for the season. Uh, I think I'd want that to be Callan Kaepernick because I think his legs would add something and, and would help Jay Ajayi, and Ajayi would help him as well. He doesn't have to learn the offense as much because he's right. just, uh, you know, he's an athlete. But with that being said, I mean, first of all, I've seen the the Dolphins' owners' political donations. They're not signing Colin Kaepernick. I can guarantee that. With that being said, I mean, Matt Moore, I think Matt Moore is one of the best backup quarterbacks in the NFL, and I think they're going to give him his crack, and I think he's going to be just fine. If you look at his yards per attempt compared to Tannehill's for their career, they're the same quarterback. They're different types of quarterbacks, but same quality. So I'm not moving anybody with this news. Yeah, so me, I think it comes down to a little bit of volume concerns for me. The efficiency should remain similar. I think you're correct in that assessment. And, and Matt Moore may be a more efficient quarterback in terms of tossing touchdowns. He Last year, uh, to close out the season, he started three games for the Dolphins. He threw eight touchdowns in those three games on just 27 attempts per game. Now, granted, you know, the defenses he played were the, the Jets, the Bills, and then the, the Patriots in Week 17. But, you know, I, I they, dial, they dial it back. As I mentioned, 27 attempts per game, you're not going to, to produce many any fantasy relevant wide receivers when you're throwing the ball 27 times per game. My concern from the Jay Ajayi standpoint is the fact that Jay Ajayi last year in wins and losses was a different player. Uh, you know, Matt mentioned the difference, you know, like how he was very inconsistent in terms of producing some of those top tier numbers in wins. Jay Ajayi averaged 18 carries, 91 rushing yards and 12.7 standard fantasy points per game in losses. He averaged just 7.6 carries per game, 30 rushing yards and six fantasy points points per game. I don't think there's any need. I think the good defense is going to help the yep. offense. They've got a real nice defense this year. No one's talking about it. Yeah, their their defense, they have a solid pass rush. They, they haven't really come together in the secondary. That's my biggest concern for them. I, I guess time will tell, but there's a lot of questions around this Miami team, so I would slightly downgrade everyone just a little bit um the next piece of news i wanted to talk about was the packers uh we've been talking about it on this show quite a bit and jamal williams is pushing ty montgomery for the starting gig in green bay so it's been not just one day but it's been multiple days now where he's been getting reps with the ones because they are saying jamal williams has walked in and done fantastic in pass protection whereas ty montgomery they say is still learning so that they i think that they they want ty montgomery to win this job but at the same time they're letting him develop into a running back as he's been playing wide receiver so uh bobby what does this what does this do for you here? I mean, does Jamal Williams bump up? Do you move Ty Montgomery down? Do you think this is just them trying to get, you know, Ty Montgomery motivated? What do you what do you take of all this? I've already got Jamal Williams 40 spots higher than ADP, so I was, you know, I was expecting this. I I think that the news coming out is probably just a light a fire under Ty Montgomery. We've got a lot of time to figure out what's going to happen during these preseason games and maybe Montgomery will look great. I'm not willing to say he's still in the job yet. I'm still really high in Jamal Williams and pretty high in Ty Montgomery. Matt, what about you? I'll tell you this. I had a couple of sources in Green Bay over the years. And if you guys remember um, years ago when they had uh, Lacey and Jonathan Franklin there, and there was that conversation of who's the guy going to be? And it was back and forth. And, and that was the Packers just kind of putting up a front. They had always gone with Lacey. They will use the media and they will use that, um, as you brought up, that uh, kind of motivating factor. So I'm not shocked by this, but at the same time, uh, I, I've talked to, to those who got to watch a lot of Jamal Williams, and this is not a surprise to me at all because I, I think he was drafted with the thought that of, okay, if we can't trust Ty Montgomery to be our prototypical lead back, and pass protection has been an issue dating back to last year, and I think it is something that is still a concern, although now he is a full-fledged running back and has had a whole offseason of being a running back. They think that way, and, and I, I, those who I've talked to that have seen a lot of Jamal Williams and thought when he came here, this was a great spot for him. As much as we talk about the Packers' passing attack, when they were at their best a couple of years ago, and it was obviously very good um, last year, but when they were at their peak a couple of years ago, this is an efficient passing attack. This was not a passing attack that ranked even in the top half of pass attempts. They were actually in the bottom third about, I think it was two or three years ago, when they were absolutely rolling with their offense. And that's fine. They want to get those big chunk plays and hit Jordy down the field. So... Part of that, though, is having a ground game that they can stay on schedule with their offense. And we love what Ty Montgomery brings to the table as a pass catcher, but the bottom line is here, and I talked to someone uh, close to the team uh, last week, is that there is concern about the 
uh, the pass protection, and they don't believe that he's going to be the kind of guy that they can rely on to carry the ball 15 times a game. I don't know if they really want him to be that player. So that could be annoying for us for fantasy. A name that's not getting brought up a lot and maybe not really should be in fantasy circles from a from a production standpoint, but somebody we have to think about is Aaron Ripkowski, who we saw as a fullback last year, get in there on third down and is reliable um, if they need to use him as more of a pass protector, as more of the halfback than the fullback position that we know he plays. So uh, I'm not surprised to see any of this out there now. Maybe they're using a little bit of that motivating factor for Ty Montgomery, and I'm not going to expect him, even if he does pick up the pass pro, to be a guy that is your prototypical lead back. Is he Theo Riddick to what you know Riddick was to Detroit last year? That might be a fair comparison, but unlike Detroit, Green Bay might have capable guys behind Theo, uh, behind Ty Montgomery, like a Jamal Williams. So I, I think this could be a uh, a, a concerted, a, a overall effort from their backfield to be better. And I, I'm with you on Jamal Williams. I, I have him in close to my top 50 right now at running back. I'm not going to go much higher than that, but I, you don't see him going very high. I think people are kind of overlooking him, but you wonder if there's little tidbits like this, and then maybe he looks good in the first preseason game or two where that really sets the ball rolling. So I'm with you on Williams. I think there's definitely something there. I tell people all the time, you need to pay attention to all three days of the draft and the UDFAs and all these guys that end up on teams because they're going to play at some point. We know whether it's great situations that turn into injury situations or just teams like Green Bay who maybe don't really have that guy, you need to be aware of everybody because at some point, maybe it's a week or two, you get that right guy, that third stringer or fourth stringer coming into the season, and you get him in week 10 or 11, that could be the difference in you winning or losing a week or if you pick him up at the right time and know who the heck he is. For sure. Yeah, I, I like everything you said there. And, you know, we've talked about in this show, I released an article yesterday talking about how much does team scoring matter for fantasy football and I went through the last five years and kind of looked at everything there were of the 30 running backs who finished in the top six for points per game 73 percent of them so 22 of 30 running backs were on top 12 scoring offenses so you definitely want to figure out who it is just as I was starting to come around a little bit on Ty Montgomery just because I, I think we understand the upside whereas if he is that running back getting 10 to 12 carries a game and then you know catching five to seven passes from the backfield the upside is unlimited uh, but I've always, always liked Jamal Williams. So this is definitely something that I I'm paying attention to. Ty Montgomery's stock is moving crazy. I mean, he was taken in the third round of an expert mock I did uh, just last weekend. So he, the hype has kind of gotten out of control where people were drafting him at his ceiling. I'm thinking that this should bring his ADP down just a little bit. Hey, by the way, guys, before we move on to this next segment where we're going to be talking about risky players, I want to remind you all, get your reviews in. We're giving away a free Fantasy Jocks championship belt and this is not a flimsy thing it is huge it is beautiful and you guys want it for your league and we're also giving away a signed amari cooper jersey from pristineauction.com all you have to do to enter these giveaways by the way we're doing the the fantasy jocks one on sunday so you got to hurry up and get your reviews in it's go to itunes subscribe and review us and send it to contest at fantasypros.com you're entered for these giveaways and all future giveaways for the rest of the season also i want to take a moment to tell you about one of today's sponsors so I know you're all fantasy football fanatics just like me, but before you just go and use the same commissioner service as always, I've got to tell you to check out the new hottest fantasy sports platform, yourrules.com. I'll definitely be using their site this year to take advantage of some of the key features that other sites aren't offering. Yourrules.com offers total league customization unlike any other fantasy site. Of all the sites out there, this is the first to offer a fantasy experience much closer to a real football game managed. There's no more set it and forget it. Finally, a fantasy football platform with the ability to actually manage the outcome of your weekly matchups. To learn more about in-game substitutions, points for penalty yardage, and the unique abilities to handle injuries, head on over to yourrules.com and register for the 2017 NFL season. Your Rules is fantasy sports your way. That's www.yourulz.com. All right, guys, so we're doing this uh, this segment here. We're going to start off with risky players 
that we do want. We're each going to go through, maybe talk about two or three players. And Mike, why don't you go ahead and start us here? All right. So we're going to start with the risky but worth it category, right? And I think that the player at top of my list right now and the one that I'm willing to take, honestly, at the start of the third round, and I get him almost every single time there is Sammy Watkins. You know, we've talked about it on the show before in that Sammy Watkins is a guy who had his second foot surgery. Some people have been burned by him. They refuse to draft him. They're like, no, 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 you can have him. Do I need to remind you that this guy was a former top five pick that was expected to be a number one wide receiver? The injuries, sure, that's that's obviously been an issue. But, you know, I've said it before, writing off, would you have written off Julio Jones after his foot surgery in 2013? Would you have written off Des Bryant after his two foot surgeries? Julian Edelman had to have two foot surgeries. All these guys have come back and, be, and returned to being the same player, if not better players, once they got the foot issues taken care of. This, this is the second one. He's got it taken care of. You know, we've, we've heard nothing but glowing reports. Great. Yeah, exactly. He's cutting on that foot. It was a mental thing as much as it was a physical thing. You know, going through his numbers, looking back at 2015, when this offense threw the ball, I think it was 430 times that year, Sammy Watkins only played in 13 games. In those 13 games, almost 1,050 yards, nine touchdowns, almost 11 yards per target. Being double and triple team the whole time because he was the only player. Yes, and Andre Holmes is probably an upgrade over what they had last year. Zay Jones should learn the slot relatively quick. Hopefully he can start producing, but Tyrod Taylor fits the the skill set that Sammy Watkins needs to right Tyron Tyron Taylor has a big arm he can also create time and if you and like I said before if if you have a cornerback I don't care who it is nobody can hang with Sammy Watkins in this league for more than a couple seconds you know his speed will get to you and if Tyron Taylor makes some time with his legs he's gonna burn you uh, this offense should throw a little bit more uh, as we go into 2017 I love Sammy Watkins and you know I'm willing to live with that risk in the third round all day long. I was not going to bring him up because I bring him up almost every episode. I love Sammy Watkins too. No more Rex Ryan, so they're going to pass the ball more. Uh, You also didn't mention the stat about how in his last 14 games, he's been every bit as good as Antonio Brown in his last 14 games. Sammy Watkins is the real deal. I'm extremely excited about him. I'd take him above Des Bryant. I know that's saying a lot, but with that uh, schedule strength for Des Bryant, I'm all over Sammy Watkins this year. Yeah, Matt, so so you know, like that stat Bobby's referring to, I went through in the, the last 14 games that Sammy Watkins has played with Tyrod Taylor, excluding those two games to start 2016, because those were obviously they shut him down because he just wasn't running. Uh, but in those last 14 games, 67 receptions, 1,236 yards, nine touchdowns over a full 16 game season. That's 1,400 yards over 10 touchdowns. That would have been more points than Antonio Brown scored in 2016. I don't think we're, we're saying that to draft him over Antonio Brown, but we're talking about the upside that Sammy Watkins has. Uh, a very talented player, as we know, and, and you guys certainly uh, detailed it there. And, and I like his quarterback, Tyrod Taylor. I think he's a value quarterback who came through last year, I think, and having Zay Jones there. But it's not like they have a ton there. So, you know, they have Charles Clay. That's nice. And yes, they have McCoy in the backfield who expects to catch a lot of passes. But Watkins is their guy. I think they'll ramp up the passing game a little bit. I think Tyrod Taylor, who throws a hell of a deep ball, uh, is only going to help. So I I like the offense there. A lot of times I I always talk about avoiding bad teams. This is not a team I want to avoid. I think this is a pretty solid group across the board. I'm not a believer in the contract year thing. But they they don't want to bring him back on that rookie deal for fifth year, which I think is going to come back and bite them in a very big way because they could have him under control for one more year at a fairly cheap price compared to if he has the season we all expect him to have, he's going to cost them or his next team a ton of money. So uh, I'm with you there. I'm willing to take the shot on him. Granted that I have a pretty solid team in front of him already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know everyone's going to expect me to talk about Kevin White and James Conner, Blake Bortles and Chris Conley. Those are my guys. But there's zero risk in taking high upside sleepers. So I'm not going to refer to them as high risk players. Um, Instead, I've been going through the entire preseason with no one I like in the fifth round unless like Golden Tate or C.J. Anderson magically falls. But one of my Twitter followers, Ryan, completely opened up my eyes to a great player in this range. Uh, Tags and I are on Twitter, by the way, at Mike Taglier NFL and at Bobby Fantasy Pro. I know we can't respond to every single comment, especially this time of the year, because there's a ton, but we do read every single one. We appreciate your support. Anyway, my player here is now Larry Fitzgerald. I know everyone's worried about his age, how he faded off at the end of last season, how Carson Palmer's an old man, so they think he's risky, but I see no risk here. Do you guys realize Larry Fitzgerald led the NFL in receptions last year? Yes. Yes. Yes, Yeah, he outscored Demarius Thomas in back-to-back years now, folks. 
His ADP is number 69. The expert consensus has him at 55, which should tell you a lot, but I just moved him into my top 40 when Ryan pointed it all out to me. I'd rather have him than Keenan Allen. Does that say enough for you guys? I'm with you on Fitz, and once again, it comes down to a situation, and I guess it really depends on how much you believe in John Brown to stay on the field. Uh, David Johnson's the most important part of their offense in Arizona, but Fitz has been a top uh, 11 player in PPR, wide receiver, the last two years. Uh, got banged up in 2014, but he's been at least a top 20 in three of the last four years, and, and yet gets to continue to be overlooked. More value in a PPR. I don't think he's going to make big plays down the field, but he's Carson Palmer's guy, and at least for one more year, that is going to be the case. I don't think anybody really approaches him in the wide receiving core, receiving core in general, um, other than obviously what David Johnson's going to bring. So just based on volume alone, he's still a good player. He's not going to go streaking down the field, but based on volume alone, yeah, I think he's kind of a guy that gets overlooked. And if you do decide to invest in a running back or two early, I think he's a guy that you could see falling on your team as a nice wide receiver too. Yeah, Larry Fitzgerald is he's he's like one of those like the boring guys, right? You know, we see him tail off over the second half of the season. He's probably one of those guys where I would have no issue drafting him as your wide receiver too, but I don't think he'll finish as high as he has in previous seasons, where he always tails off over the second half of the season. I think last year it was almost out of necessity. You know, his targets, I want to say he was up over 150 targets last year, which that's not going to happen with John Brown in the field. You know, David Johnson, they apparently are, I don't, I don't believe in all that talk that they're going to try and get him 1,000 and 1,000. I think it, it all depends on the game, right? Bruce Arians wants to win football games. And if David Johnson gets 1,000 receiving yards, he does. If, they, if they're going to win football games without it, they'll do that. Uh, I think a lot of it does hinge on John Brown because, as I mentioned last year, is that Larry Fitzgerald was out of necessity. You know, Jerron Brown went down for the year. Uh, John Brown was hurting, not playing a lot of the snaps. Michael Floyd, he was just bad, and then they let him go. So there was there was a lot going on there last year. Uh, but, yeah, definitely, definitely, um, I like it. Okay, Matt, so who's your first guy? Uh, I'm going to start here with someone who, based on his ADP, I think the concern is built in for him, although I expect this ADP to start to rise. That's Danny Woodhead for the Ravens. And I, every time you bring up Danny Woodhead, there are people that go, oh, my God, yes, I'll take Danny Woodhead because all the catches you get. And then people that will say, well, he's missed a ton of time in the last couple of years. Well, I look and he's at him old, now, yeah. yeah. And he's old. I get, I get all of that. But I'm willing to take the risk because – and I would draft him higher than he's going right now as running back 27 in PPR. Uh, I think that's going to move up now, um, especially with the injuries in their backfield with, with Dixon now being out. Um, but you look at what's being left here. Um, you have with the, uh, once again, for just starting with Dennis Pitta, 18.2% of the target share uh, needs to be made up for right there. Crockett Gilmore is now hurt. They don't really have a tight end that you're pointing out and going, well, they have that guy there. Um, yes, they brought in Macklin. Uh, I get that, and I think he's going to eat up a, a decent portion of that. But the Kyle Jusick role is now also open, and those catches uh, are, are open for that team. Um, we have seen a lot of throwing out of Joe Flacco in Baltimore, especially last year, a, a way too high of a number. I don't think that will be repeated. But you look here, I, I think there's a little bit too much, and I, I've been on this train, I'm kind of getting off it now, a little too much excitement about Brashad Perriman. I think he's a good player, but may end up being better in reality versus fantasy. I think he's more of a deep threat. I don't think he'll be very consistent. Maybe kind of a Kenny Stills. I'm kind of feeling like that's what he is and people are expecting more, and maybe he will be. Mike Wallace led that team last year with 17.4% of the wide receiver target share. That's not a very high number when you talk about your lead wide receiver so I think there's a lot there for Danny Woodhead to make up especially at the tight end position and now with the injury uh, to Dixon so I'm willing to take him very high especially in PPR he he probably has the biggest discrepancy along with Theo Riddick in, in terms of running backs who are affected in PPR versus non-PPR but to see where he's going that injury risk is already built into his ADP because people aren't willing to buy in uh, at least at that high of a number we know this guy could be a top 10 PPR PPR running back, and I think he's got a shot to be at least top 20. I have him in my top 15 at running back in PPR, so you don't have to pay up to get him. I will pay up to get him, um, but right now, it, it just feels like those injury and the age sometimes overshadow people's thoughts on how high his ceiling is in PPR formats. We talked about it last episode, and I said that people have a hard time separating reality and fantasy football, right? And I think Danny Woodhead falls in this category because he's finished as a top 10 PPR running back twice in his career already. Nobody wants to say that he's a top 10 running back because he's not. 
but but he has finished there, so we know what the ceiling is, right? The issue is in terms of this is it comes down to the scoring offense, right? We don't I don't we don't know if Danny Woodhead is going to be on a, on a high scoring offense. We think Baltimore will fall down to maybe being a top twelve scoring offense. I have them projected in the bottom ten, uh, but yes, I am with Matt hundred percent on this because Danny Woodhead is being taken as the thirty fourth running back off the board. He's going tw- uh, eleven spots at the running back position behind Tevin Coleman. I will tell you this right now. If you catch me in a draft, a PPR draft, I will select Danny Woodhead over Tevin Coleman every yeah, single not even close. time. And it, no, it's not close. Tevin Coleman, I would actually draft Derrick Henry over Tevin Coleman, but I'm in the minority on that. But I, I agree with you. I mean, Danny Woodhead, my projection model, he popped up as the number 20 PPR running back. Now, do you need to draft him as the number 20 back? No. You, you get him in that you know 28 to 30 range, you're guaranteed to get him, and you have some room for growth. When Kenneth Dixon went down, that obviously freed up some more targets to the running backs, though I think he's going to play more of like a slot receiver type role than anything. All right, Tags, who's your second guy? All right, so the next guy I want to talk about is Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks is a guy that, yes, he comes with risk, and yes, it is worth it. And the reason I say this is, you know, being a projections guy, we've talked about this, I think, with J.J. Zacharyson when he was on. It's trouble finding targets for certain players in these offenses with all these moving parts, right? But here's the thing. In the range where Brandon Cooks is going, he's going around those guys like DeAndre Hopkins, uh, Demarius Thomas, Allen Robinson, Alshon Jeffrey. Those are all guys that, you know, they're, they have question marks as well, right? I think people underestimate the fact that when they say a player is boomer bust, we we talk about this all the time. You are lucky to get half of your performances with 12 or more PPR points out of a wide receiver. So when you look at these guys and you're like, there's only going to be like 12 guys a year that get you, you know, 60% of those performances. Brandon Cooks, you live with the ups and downs of being in the New England Patriots offense in order to get those highs because his highs are going to be much higher than someone like DeAndre Hopkins, than Demarius Thomas, who Demarius Thomas, by the way, has not scored 25 PPR points since week 12 of 2014. That just goes to show you his limited upside. Is he a safe player? Sure. Uh, Allen Robinson, we know his problem right now. We saw it last year. This year, they're going to be throwing maybe 100 less times per year. I'm not even joking when I say that. Alshon John Jeffrey's already missing practices. Terrell Pryor, he may be someone that you're excited about, but at the same time, there is limitations here. Brandon Cooks, take him and live with the ups and downs. Take the Patriots offense, I'm telling you. He finished number eight last year among wide receivers. Like, how far do you expect him to drop? Like, maybe he drops to 16? Yeah. Well, it's hard to argue the fact that going from Drew Brees to Tom Brady is a downgrade, right? Most people leave Drew Brees. They're like, well, that's going to suck leaving Drew Brees because you just left yeah, one of the most. And it's def- not like the Saints didn't have weapons either. I mean, we're talking about Demarius Thomas finished number 19. Hopkins finished number 37 behind Sterling Shepard. Hopkins played the entire season. <laughs> yeah, I know. Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks. Now, I understand the concerns about him, but I but the, at the same time. Like I said, people overestimate the amount of wide receivers who aren't boom or bust. There's there's yeah. there's a handful of guys. I think it ends with like Michael Thomas. I, I you know Des Bryant's going to be boom or bust. T.Y. Hilton with this Andrew Luck situation, he's probably going to be boom or bust. We know Amari Cooper hasn't quite hit his stride. So even I those Doug guys, Baldwin. Doug Baldwin's been boom or bust too. So there's a lot of guys here, but I will take the booms from Brandon Cooks while I take the ups and downs of his performances as well. So with Brandon Cooks, um, I ranked him very high last year. He ended up coming through, as we saw at the Saints. And I know there was people concerned, even with Drew Brees, that, you know, he'd have those up and down weeks based on the home and away splits. And we saw him come through. He is a very talented player. There's been the debate, and I get it, between where he's going and where Julian Edelman is going. And, And I do understand that there's that difference there. And you have to pay up more for Cooks. Well, you're paying up more for a talented player a much he's a better player he's got more physical talent than Julian Edelman and And he's still so young we don't know how good he's going to be yes and we have what's what's always the kind of the joke when we get to the first round of the draft oh the Patriots are going to trade out of the first round the fact that they traded in uh gave up their first round pick not to trade back and, and gather picks to trade their first round pick for Brandon Cooks and the third shows, and the third right but what they gave up to get Brandon Cooks tells me that there is a big role and a big need a Super Bowl team who went and won the thing without Rob Gronkowski felt the need to then go trade for Brandon Cooks knowing Gronk is healthy and is coming back they made that move 
Now he's playing with Tom Brady, so he's going from one Hall of Fame quarterback to another in an offense that I trust a little bit more. Uh, I mean, that that should tell you a lot about Brandon Cook. So I know they have a lot of options there, and I, I know they have a deep backfield, and the Patriots can drive us nuts at times, but they also can put up about 40 points a game without a question, and I don't worry about them taking their foot off the gas no matter what the score is. So getting to play with Brady on a better overall team, uh, I, I'm still very high on Cook, so I don't, I'm a with you. I don't think the risk is really there. I don't think the bad weeks are going to be that bad. And I think the great weeks are going to be outstanding. Yeah. Are, are you telling me you think Tom Brady's a Hall of Fame quarterback? I'm and he's kidding. 40, I, if you I, haven't I, heard, by the way. He yeah. just turned 40 years old. So I've I don't been know getting if you heard so that as well. much heat on Twitter for having Tom Brady as my number four quarterback. Like Tom Brady lovers, I, I love Tom Brady, but not as much as everybody else, I guess. People hate me for it. <laughs> Tom Brady supporters are like hardcore. Did you hear what uh, Rob Gronkowski said? They, they said, Gronk, what did you get Tom Brady for his 40th birthday? He goes, I get him touchdowns. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, guess what? I'm sure that's all Brady wants anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're exactly right. So my second guy is Spencer Ware. I know people have been loving what they see in Kareem Hunt, but I think Spencer Ware would have been a top six running back last season had he not sustained a concussion. I mean, sure, he might not end up the same as we saw pre-concussion, but pre-concussion version of Ware in Andy Reid's offense, we're talking about getting a second-round player in the fourth round, and with that kind of upside, you can win your league. Dude, dude. I swear to God, Bobby, you and I are in sync on this one. I have an article pending my player profiles that I've been doing all off season. I think I'm on my like 22nd one, um, but I wrote like I think it was like 1,200 words on Spencer Ware and why you want him uh, in a fantasy draft, and it's 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 gold. Like just wait, it's gonna drop. I think on Monday I'm gonna put that one out. So uh, just wait for that, and uh, I'm with you. In sync, 100% on Spencer Ware. Matt, what's your take on the, the Chiefs running back situation? So I'm not going to be on your side with this one, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, Spencer okay. Ware last year, <laughs> the number 17 running back in PPR. Uh, I, I just never saw anything that got me excited about Spencer Ware. Four top 15 finishes, four top 20 finishes is, is not a very high number in PPR. Uh, just eight times in the top 30 all year long. I understand the thought on Hunt. I, I, I thought he fell in the right spot. What I can totally feel happening is that the Chiefs are a solid team and that if there are people that are big hunt backers, if they draft him, expecting him to be the guy sooner rather than later, and that doesn't happen because let's say the Chiefs get off to like a 4-2 and two start, and Ware is not great, but the offense is staying on schedule, and Hill's doing a good job, and Alex Smith's playing competent quarterback, which is all that I think anybody really expects from him at his very best, and Kelsey's getting it done, and their defense is good. If they're getting off to a solid start, I could totally see them just going, Ware's doing fine. We're going to stick with him, and then people get mad that Hunt's not getting his chances. I have fallen into that trap before. I go, I know that guy's better. I know he's more talented. I know he's got more upside. Why aren't they playing him? And you don't see that happen. What I think could happen, though, is if in that division, which should be very competitive, I think all four teams certainly, I think their Super Bowl aspirations for the Raiders, the Chiefs have been solid, the Broncos have been solid, uh, I think the Chargers can get back there, I think it's a very competitive division, so if you get halfway through the season, and you wonder about the backfield, and there's not enough juice there, and the Chiefs go, you know what, if we're going to contend, if we're going to get a, a wild card or have a shot to win this division, we got to take our offense to the next level. I don't think the offense has a very high ceiling as it's set up right now, and I don't think the Chiefs are too mad about that, but if they want to go to that next spot, I think the upside of Hunt and the fact that I think he is a more talented player has to be there. So I'm, I'm kind of split on this. I think Ware is just kind of a guy. There's nothing special to him, but I think he keeps the offense on schedule, and that could be good for maybe the first half of the season. And based on... Uh, um, you know, where he's going. Uh, there seems to be kind of people going back and forth on, on how they feel about him. But in the fifth round, is that going to be a guy? Do I want to take a guy in the fifth or sixth round that I only feel good about for half the season? You might say yes to that. I, I just think he's going a little bit too high for me with the threat of Hunt there. Not necessarily right away, but at some point down the road. You're gonna wanna, you're Matt. You're definitely gonna wanna check out this piece that I come out with. Um, it's got it highlights the, the 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 display of what happened with Spencer Ware and what like there was a legitimate turning point for him because you know Bobby mentioned it the concussion. Uh, you know I think a lot of people don't talk about this enough. And you know we we talk about the the concussions and what they can do long term over a player's career, but the short term effects of them. Whereas the Bears uh, linebacker Leonard Floyd had he came out this offseason and said you know it took him two months to really feel like he was. 
back to himself, that he was able to focus more as days went on. And, you know, as a running back, those little things, like if you are literally a split, like a tenth of a second off, it's going to change what happens in terms of your performance. And Spencer Ware, legitimately, it was night and day from before and after his concussion. Whereas if you go back and you look at the start from weeks one to seven, you look at the end of 2015, you're able to see a clear trend with Spencer Ware. And on top of that, you know, you mentioned, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Kareem Hunt is not an issue, like uh, something that can potentially harm that. But that's why Spencer Ware is going in the fifth or sixth round, right? Otherwise, Spencer Ware would be a second round pick. He'd be discussed in that range of guys like Jordan Howard, Todd Gurley. You're getting that discount. And I would argue that you could actually draft both Spencer Ware and Kareem Hunt, and you're, you are guaranteed RB1 value by taking both of them. So I, I definitely love the situation, but Spencer Ware is someone that I'm betting on because I've seen what he can do. Yeah. All right, Matt, let's do your uh, second player here. Uh, I'm going to go with C.J. Anderson in Denver, and I know he's had a lot of injury concerns. I know you mentioned him before, Bobby, but I I look at what's going on in Denver, and you were just talking about Demarius Thomas as well and how his upside's kind of been capped, and I think you look at the quarterback situation there. What I like about C.J. Anderson is I I think, once again, because of the injury history going back as, as, um, as late as last year, early as last year, you don't have to pay up for C.J. Anderson. He's going off the board around running back 22. So he's a low-end RB2 and a 12-teamer. And I think he's a great, not great, but but a perfect, I would say. Great is giving you some upside. But if I have him as a running back two on my team, I'm very happy with that because I look at what's going on in that backfield. Booker, last year, a lot of people were, were very high in Booker. He's going to take the job from C.J. Anderson. So there was those weeks before Anderson's injury when as a tandem, they gave you a very nice backfield in Denver. It was solid for fantasy, both guys at fantasy value. It did cap the ceiling of C.J. Anderson, but I thought they worked well in a tandem. When Anderson went down, the thought was, okay, Booker could be a top 10 running back, and he failed miserably in that role to the point that Justin Forsett was their most important running back on their way uh, down the stretch last year, which tells you a lot about Booker. No, I'm not totally down on Booker. The injury right now does not help him at all. I do believe that Booker and Anderson are better as a tandem and can help each other out. But with Booker now banged up, I'll tell you somebody I'm not really worried about at all, and that's Jamal Charles. They signed him to a very small deal compared to, let's say, what Adrian Peterson got from the Saints. And both guys have missed a lot of time in the last couple of years. I don't know how much Jamal Charles has left, but what he does have left, I don't consider any kind of significant threat to the lead back role, which I think is clearly C.J. Anderson's job. They've talked about him being in shape. Whatever that means, I don't really care. But I look at the quarterback situation. It looks like it's still Trevor Simeon right now, which is a whole other story about where Paxton Lynch is at. The receivers are good. They're very good. I think they're, like I said, capped by the quarterback situation. It's also still a very good defense. And... Maybe not that elite level where they were at, but I still think it's a very good defense that you know they want to play defense and they want to run the heck out of the football, which they have in C.J. Anderson. So you don't have to pay up that top 15, even going back a couple years, that top 10 price tag at the running back position for C.J. Anderson. Uh, Maybe he misses a game or two, but if he can stay on the field, I think he's going to be a very valuable player to your fantasy team and not someone you're really going to have to worry about too much. I know the ceiling isn't what we hoped it would be a couple years ago, but you're not paying up for that anymore. I think he's just going to be a nice, solid running back on a team, by the way, that is good, that wants to run the ball, and that will use him and should give him plenty of chances uh, with their good defense always keeping them in games. And they have three new offensive linemen that are happen to be very, right. very good. They they stole the Cowboys, one of their best guards. Ron Leary went there. Menelik Watson from the Raiders went there. And Garrett Bowles, who a lot of people had as their number one tackle in the draft, he also went to Denver. C.J. Anderson is is he's been a man amongst he, yeah he's been a man amongst boys in terms of in that Denver backfield and compared to what he's done to everyone else, you know. Most people point to backup running backs and, oh, this guy's got a higher yards per carry than the starter. Usually it's because they have fresh legs. They see different defensive packages. You know, they, they'll see six, seven man fronts, whereas the starter, you know, he'll see seven and eight. But C.J. Anderson is someone who's the opposite. You know, he's been performing consistently better than the backups and uh, the, the better offensive line can only help. Uh, I think they want to run the ball and uh, people forget about the point that, you know, Miami tried to sign him last offseason right. and Denver pulled it back. Nobody expected Denver to match that offer, but they do love the guy. He's healthy and, um, you know, the health's the only concern. 
All right, guys, we're going to move on over to uh, to risky players that we don't want to take the risk on. I'm going to start us off this time. Um, you know, it, this is kind of hard for me, uh, this segment, because I love risky players. I usually draft like eight of them, and if five of them work out, you win your league, right? And if not, well, then maybe you finish last, but how's that any different than having a mediocre team? Uh, anyways... I'm coming out with fire from the get-go in this segment. Melvin Gordon is my guy, and I know people probably haven't been considering him risky, but I think he's a major risk in the first round. Okay, listen to these three players from the last two seasons. LeGarrette Blunt, 4.0 yards per carry, 1,864 yards, 25 touchdowns. Frank Gore, 3.8 yards per carry, 1,992 yards, 15 touchdowns. Melvin Gordon, 3.7 yards per carry. 1,638 and 12 touchdowns. I mean, granted the difference is that Gordon has some hands on him, but this is not a great running back. This is not a good running back and definitely not a first round running back. I can understand if you told me his ceiling was another touchdown inflated RB number eight performance, maybe even a little better, but what's his floor? I'm not talking about injury risk. I'm talking about the Chargers finding someone who can actually run the ball with some talent. I'm not doing that risk. I would not take Melvin Gordon in my top 20. Wow, that's bold. Not saying you wouldn't take him top 20. Matt, what's your take on Melvin Gordon? I get it. I, I get what you're saying with that. You want the yards to carry to be better. At the same time, he's still a young running back, so there is room for him to improve. I have him in a different tier, probably the uh, of the RB1s. I kind of have like three tiers here. He's the start of that third tier. And I really only have him that high because I think all of the points that you made are certainly fair. I really only have him that high because I look at their backfield and go, Who's challenging him for touches? To right. me, it's a volume situation where he's getting it. Now, I have brought this point up on Twitter. I have looked around and said, they need somebody. I don't want to hear about this Andre Williams talk. Uh, I think D'Angelo Williams is a perfect spot. Behind, I think he's the perfect guy to put behind Melvin Gordon. I and think D'Angelo Williams could steal his job. I am confident of that. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I think he could steal enough touches that they know they, they they put a lot on Gordon's plate. Look, we all hoped he'd bounce back. He did far better than that. He ex- I think he exceeded all expectations in the fantasy world and reality last year. So now those expectations get adjusted to a much higher level, which is why he is being drafted where he is. From a volume standpoint, I have to put him high. I don't think you can avoid that. But if they sign D'Angelo Williams... If the Cowboys decide to not stick with Alfred Morris, which could be the case depending on what happens to Zeke Elliott, uh, I think they need somebody there. And if there is somebody there, I could scale Gordon back enough uh, enough to me that I, I, I'll tell you right now, I don't want to take him over the other wide receivers that are going around that spot. Maybe that's uh, T.Y. Hilton. Maybe that's Jordy Nelson. Maybe in some cases people are letting Mike Evans fall down a little bit there. I'd rather take any of the wide receivers there before I take Melvin Gordon. Gordon because I, I do worry about him not being at that 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 really highly talented level. I have him there based on opportunity to his credit. He took the ball, and, and from a fantasy standpoint, he did everything we could hope for last year. I think your points are valid. If they were to bring somebody in, though, that's a reliable backup, which I don't think they have right now, I think people should have to reassess where Melvin Gordon's going. So I get it. I'm, I still like the guy from a volume standpoint. I think he can get better in year three. Uh, I hope the O-line can stay intact, which has been a massive issue, along with all of the injuries in, uh, for the Chargers. But um, from right now, from a volume standpoint, I just can't knock him down too far. Yeah. I mean, I like Blunt and Gore from a volume standpoint, though, too. What do you think, Tags? Well, Forrest Lamb is already hurt. One of the guards they brought in right. that was supposed to be contributing yeah. right away, and that's that's an issue, too. Okay, so Melvin Gordon, to me, I, I see where Matt's coming from, and that's, where I, that's why I have Melvin Gordon ranked as my number six running back. Because from a volume standpoint, you can't erase it, right? Andre Williams is not going to push him for carries. I don't think that they're going to bring in D'Angelo Williams. I don't see it happening. I do think that Brandon Oliver is going to cap his receiving upside. You know, last year, Melvin Gordon did a lot more receiving than people realize. I don't think Melvin Gordon is a top tier talent in this league. I don't think he's a top six running back in terms of talent. That's why you see the lower yards per carry. Does it mean everything? No, because that offensive line is horrible. The one part where Melvin Gordon, he really failed his his rookie year was scoring touchdowns, right? He had tons of yards. He just he couldn't get in the end zone. And it was it was the talk of the town. What he did in the offseason was spent it with Adrian Peterson. And it showed last year. When they got down the goal line, he put his head down and he was he was a monster on the goal line last year. There's nothing I can do to take that away from him. He worked 
Peterson, he worked with Peterson again this offseason with Joe Mixon, with Ty Montgomery. They got together as a group and were working out together. So it, do I think that helps? Sure, I think it does. I think another thing that helps is, Bobby, we've talked about it, the AFC West passing schedule is not good. It's very, very rough. And if, if they want to take some pressure off Phillip Rivers, they're going to run the ball. That's why Melvin Gordon's there. I don't think it's necessarily a talent standpoint. I think the offense he's playing on is better than guys like Jordan Howard, better than guys like Jay Ajayi, you know, like that tier. And that's why I think it's like almost by default, Melvin Gordon is going there. I don't think it has to do with his talent necessarily. So I understand, I understand when you say it's risky, but not worth it. All right, Matt, who's your uh, who's your first guy? Uh, in, in terms of guys I'd, I'd like to stay away from, and it's based on ADP, Alshon Jeffrey really does scare me. Uh, the number one wow. wide receiver, 17 wide receiver. I like Carson Wentz a lot. It, it's easy, and, and that's a talent thing. It is so easy, and I, this is the world we live in, this debate-driven world of black or white, he stinks, or he's great. Like That's not Carson Wentz. And as a rookie quarterback with a rookie head coach on a rebuilding team that had scorched earth from Chip Kelly, I didn't expect him to be really good, and I didn't expect him to stink, and this is, I think we've learned this with Ryan Tannehill as well, as people had such high expectations when he didn't hit him. was like, oh, he's, he's not a franchise guy. Well, not every franchise quarterback is a top five, top seven guy. You can get away with a very solid quarterback based on it's a team game, how it's built around him. I think that's what happened to Carson Wentz last year. They got off to a hot start. Okay, our number two overall pick is coming through. We're going to be better than expected. And then the wheels fell off, and it was Lane Johnson, and it was the defense looking terrible. And then you're putting Carson Wentz in a situation where he's got to throw the ball 40 to 60 times in a game, and that happened last year. That's ridiculous, and his receivers stunk. Now, at the same point... Carson Wentz had his issues as well. Can he get better? Absolutely, and you'd expect that to happen. But I don't think he, he's going to make necessarily a massive jump this year. I will give the Eagles credit for putting guys like Jeffrey around him, adding Torrey Smith. I think giving him more help in the backfield with the Garrett Blunt there, just some consistency back there. Not necessarily great, but for Alshon Jeffrey, I look at a player who, while the talent can be easily a top 15 guy, I think we know that. There's no question about that. We have seen it before. But Alshon Jeffrey, in his five years in the NFL, this is a scary stat, stat, stat to me, and it's obviously multiple reasons why this has happened. But in his five years in the NFL, he has more finishes outside of the top 40 than he does in the top 20. He has a finish at eight. Three years ago, uh, excuse me, in uh, 2013 and 10 in 2014. But other than that, he's outside of the top 40 in these other three years. That is suspension. That is injury. I was told by somebody last year there was always a, a, a concern and, and a knock on Jeffrey is that when he got hurt, he didn't work that hard to come back. He wasn't rehabbing as hard as he should have. And now he's on a one year deal in Philadelphia. So, okay, does he got to prove himself? Well, last year in a contract year, uh, on the franchise tag, he got himself suspended for four games. So I don't believe in that motivation because he's had it and he screwed it up already, and now it only gave him a one-year deal. I just I, I get the talents there. But Wentz has got to have to take a little bit more of a step forward, and I don't know if he takes a massive step forward. Even if he takes a little step forward, that's good. I just want to see progression. He doesn't have to be great in year number two to live up to his number two draft status. You want to see him take a step forward. So you're asking Alshon Jeffrey to stay on the field, stay out of trouble, stay healthy, for Carson Wentz to be better, for the whole offense to be better, and you have to pay up for the upside that we haven't seen, frankly, nearly enough of from Alshon Jeffrey. If he finishes in the top 15, I'm not going to be surprised, but I don't feel the need to pay up for a guy when I know the wide receiver talent pool is very deep, and I know that I don't have to take a risk on any wide receiver because there's more than enough to grab, especially guys in his talent level and, and guys that are ha maybe in better situations as well. Yeah, yeah. Alshon Jeffrey, someone I've talked about this offseason, the fact that I won't own much of him. I wrote him up on a player profile, uh, and I know we're running short on time, so I do want to hit on, uh, maybe I'll hit one player here and then you guys can give another one uh but joe mixon someone to me that's getting risky and not worth the risk uh you know we've talked about him on the show and that we believe in his talent i think joe mixon's a phenomenal talent i think he's going to be really good in this league for a long time the issue is that we were banking on the fact that geo bernard was going to miss a couple of games to start the season that's not happening geo bernard's out there they're saying great things about him they do this every year with geo bernard so i'm not going overboard on geo bernard but that does not mean that he's not going to get 10 touches per game geo bernard is going to be worked in. 
Jeremy Hill has been phenomenal on the goal line. Regardless of how bad he's been everywhere else in the field, Jeremy Hill gets it done on the goal line. There was a beat reporter that came out, I think it was late last night, that said he's projecting Jeremy Hill to come out of the gates as the starter in this offense. Now, again, beat reporters have been saying some crazy things this offseason. You, you have to kind of watch everything take place, but this is a three-headed monster where I don't I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities that Joe Mixon starts out in a three-way timeshare, and how can you justify a guy that's gone into started being drafting in, inside the top 16 running backs? How can you justify spending that pick on a guy that's in a timeshare? It's just I, I can't do it anymore. I am the complete opposite as you, so I'll tell you why I can justify. I, I have to admit, when I heard about how great Gio Bernard looked again, I was really worried, and then I think about Jeremy Hill waiting to vulture touchdowns, and then Mixon almost had a big foot injury the other day. Yeah. Here's what it comes down to, though. He's a better goal line back than Jeremy Hill. He's a better cast patcher. He's a better pass catcher than Gio Bernard. Joe Mixon is a superstar in the making. There's nothing that's going to slow him down. He might get 20 plus touches per game because superstars earn their way into big touches. And I'm convinced Joe Mixon is exactly that. One of the most accurate experts every year, Jake Seeley, uh, just took him in the second round of an expert draft you did, Tags. So make of that what you will. Joe Mixon's going number 36 right now. I'm still buying him ahead of that. I'm with you on Mixon. Uh, I think he's he's a, he's a hell of a player, and I, I I agree. It's not like this is a situation in New Orleans where Mark Ingram's coming off of uh, another really good year, and you're bringing Peterson in, and you're going like, oh, like is Peterson going to take away from him? Jeremy Hill's been all touchdowns. He's had a couple of big runs here and there, but since his rookie year, when he had that great second half of the season, he's been a very disappointing player. That is why they took Joe Mixon. I don't think you take Joe Mixon and the baggage that comes with him and the concerns there, and I know the Bengals take these players on, um, if you're happy with what you have in, in Jeremy Hill. And Jeremy Hill really has only gotten by on his random big game here or there, and mostly on his touchdowns, double-digit touchdowns. That's what's carried him. Uh, if that's his role, Joe Mixon can easily overtake that. I, I, I understand what the beat writer's saying. It's August 4th or 6th or whatever it is. It's not August 29th. That's what I know it is right now. We're not even close in terms of uh, picking out these guys. If this was, like I said, a situation in New Orleans where you're adding a good back to a backfield that has a player coming off a good season like Mark Ingram, I would understand it a little bit more. But this is adding a, a superstar player who arguably could have been the number one running back in, in uh, of the rookie class if he hadn't gotten himself into trouble. But he did, and we can't ignore that. Uh, you're adding him to a backfield that has been underwhelming, whether it's because of Bernard's injury or because Jeremy Hill has fallen off from where he was in his rookie season. You're adding him to that mix because you want to give yourself an upgrade. So I think it could be annoying, at least early on, especially with Hill maybe staying in the mix. But Joe Mixon is too good to be kept down for very long. So I I'm with Bobby, I I and I'm with Jake as well. I, I think he's too good. I, I am not worried about him. I'm not concerned. Maybe there's a slow start from fantasy purposes, but I don't think you hold him down very long, and I certainly think Jeremy Hill's not going to be the guy that blocks him for very long. Well, so that's the thing, though. I've been talking about this and the fact that, like again, Joe Mixon is easily the most talented running back in this backfield. That is not a question in my mind. I was I was willing to draft Joe Mixon literally like two weeks ago until we hear that Gio Bernard is, is fine and like the injury never happened but so logically guys let's like let's talk about this let's say that there's 28 touches per game to be had in this backfield you're not Jeremy Hill is not going to get zero carries a game that's that's not going to happen like they're if they have him on the roster they're going to give him at least five to seven touches per week Gio Bernard I talked about it he's going to get 10 touches per week like naturally that's just going to happen so where are we finding the touches and on top of that we have an offensive line that there's been some serious <laughs> problems with you know they just lost two of their best offensive linemen this offseason the left tackle and the right guard so you know one's an interior lineman which can really affect it Mixon's a pass catcher I get that but Gio Bernard is also a pass catcher so again I you guys don't have any concern about him being taken in the second and third round with everything that I just talked about and like like I said from a projection concern, standpoint yeah but it's a risk I'm willing to take the upsides there second round's probably too expensive yeah if he turns into David Johnson are you going to be surprised no, I guess I wouldn't be actually, you know, and, and I, you know, Bobby, I said this too, is the only way to escape the media storm that they've been receiving from the draft pick of Mixon is to put him on the field and let his play do the talking because he is that talented. So yeah, maybe you guys are right. And, and once again, like the West, the North other than the Browns should be a competitive division. And if you're fighting for playoff spots, and, and like I said, I think any of the four teams in the AFC West can make the playoffs. There's a division there to win. Uh, you only have two wild card spots. So the Steelers are good. 
enough to contend in that division. I think the Ravens are always going to be there. Maybe they're not that exciting. And then the Bengals. So do the Bengals say, you know what? Enough of Jeremy Hill. They've benched him before uh, for, for the lesser offenses. Now they have a guy that can legitimately overtake him. Maybe it doesn't happen right away. Mike, I'm with you on that. I, I get that. I, I, I can see that happening where you keep Hill, you still give him a chance. But at some point, you go, all right, we have the better player. This is why we drafted this guy. Jeremy, uh, thanks for your help, but no, it, it's not <laughs> happening. That's why I'm so high on Mixon, because I don't think you can hold him down for very long. I'm trying to look it up right now, because Jeremy Hill, to cut him real quick, it, would be, it wouldn't be very expensive for them to cut Jeremy Hill, and he's actually relatively Maybe cheap. Maybe he ends so. up on this. Is that a trade? Trainers. No, is that a trade? Because I brought that up in the draft when it happened. I said, you know, you don't need this guy anymore. If Bernard is all the way back, you don't need someone at the level of Jeremy Hill. You could have a an Andre Williams or somebody like that, just a third guy there. And I think Jeremy Hill could have certainly more value than that to the Bengals. So does that bring them back help? Does that bring them some O-line help back? I know that's very hard to find, but does that bring them something back? Running back injuries are going to happen. Hopefully we don't have any big ones, but some have popped up already. Does someone need help from a still young player in Jeremy Hill? I I think that's a possibility, especially if they are extra confident in mixing before the season even begins. Just a 1.2 million cap hit um, in terms of his salary. Uh, he's an unrestricted free agent next year, so this could get interesting. Okay, guys, I've got one more player, and I'm going to go pretty quick here, and then we'll let Matt finish this off. Eddie Lacy's my next guy. Oh, you stole him. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if people remember this, but he's coming off a season-ending ankle injury. Sure, he could return to being an RB1, but this offensive line is just abysmal. There's so many things that could go wrong here. I'm not the least bit interested. He could re-aggravate the ankle or be entirely outplayed by one of the other 80 running backs on the roster. He could gain 40 pounds for just split carries. I mean, I'm, I'm just not interested. And so I stole your guy, Matt. You uh, all we're hearing about is he's in shape. Well, good, he should be in shape. He's an NFL running back. I don't like. I feel like that's overtaking anything that's happening on the field. Uh, I spoke to Bob Condotta from the I think Seattle Times uh, on my radio show on Sirius like uh, two months ago, and I said, "Hey, I get that Lacey's hitting all of these weight, you know, thresholds, and he's uh, okay. That's great, but you could be in shape and." not look very good on the field or just, you know, be doing your job. I I think you made the right point about Lacey. He hasn't been a real useful fantasy running back in like three years now uh, on a, on a team that I think you felt a little better about at least their O-line in in Green Bay. You don't have those, uh, you know, that that same confidence in the Seattle O-line, like you said, and, I'm not saying Thomas Rawls is great, but I asked, and like the thought is, you know, Thomas Rawls has been doing a pretty good job all off season. Um, it's not like Eddie Lacy's running away with this. It's that name value that so many people latch on to. Oh, I know Eddie Lacy is. I know he's been a top ten running back in the past. That was a long time ago. He's on a different team now, and he's on a team that I don't think is as fantasy friendly, at least from a ground game standpoint. And Thomas Rawls is going as RB fifty two in PPR. Eddie Lacy's going as RB twenty six. I don't see the 26 pick difference between uh, the 26 spot difference between those two guys. I'm going to take Rawls later all day long. I don't get the point in paying up for Lacey when all we really know is that he is hitting the weight thresholds. That's what we know. Uh, there the has last been nothing one, negative. They didn't report the last one, though. They didn't report the last one, so he actually may not have. They've been announcing it every time he hits it. They didn't announce the last one that he was supposed to hit. That should be the bare minimum expectations for Eddie Lacey. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the yeah, fact yeah. that they didn't announce yeah. it might even scare us off even more, and maybe that will knock him down. So I get that he's hitting those weight things, but that doesn't make me think, well, he's going to be the guy, and I don't think Seattle feeling that way either. Uh, this could be an annoying backfield. I, I Right now, I might feel the best about Procise because I think we yes. know what his role is as a third down guy, as a PPR back. I don't think that role is going to change where I could see Seattle kind of going, all right, this week it's Lacey. He's getting it done. All right, this week it's Rawls. Maybe it's a three-week chunk here, a two-week chunk there. And I think that's all they're trying to get. I mean, this is one of the worst rushing teams in football last year. They were out rushed. Their leading running back last year, uh, which I think was Kristen Michael off the top of my head, was actually outrushed by Tyrod Taylor. Think about the Seattle superstar years that that their offense has been with Marshawn Lynch and Rawls a couple of years back, how great they've been. And now to have the point that their leading rusher last year was outrushed by the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. I mean, that was a big problem. And they had issues with Wilson being hurt, and he played through that, and I get that. But they want to have that ground game back, and I don't think they care where they get it. So we might get, you know, people can get blinded by the weight stuff and the name value of Eddie Lacy. 
But I, I don't want to rush to to a judgment to say he's definitely going to be the guy. And based on where they're going, I'd rather have Procise and I'd rather have Rawls just based on their draft slots right now. Procise could be turned out to be a steal this year. I've been coming yep. more and more around on him. I think that often that that offense needs someone like him because their offensive line is crap. I don't really. It doesn't even matter if it's Rawls or Lacey for me. It's just their offensive line is legitimately the worst in the NFL. They did nothing to solidify it. This is. This is like Philip Rivers for Russell Wilson. Fortunately, Russell Wilson is a, is a bit mobile, so he can get away. But at the same time, I, I can't believe they've ignored that offensive line as much as they have. Amazing. All right, guys. Well, that's where we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Matt, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Guys, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's our pleasure, Matt. Take care. And for those of you listening at home, we have three more exciting episodes coming on with some heavy hitters from the fantasy industry. Make sure to tune in for those. Subscribe and review us on iTunes so you can get entered for the Fantasy Jocks Championship Belt Giveaway to end Sunday and the signed Amari Cooper jersey from pristineauction.com. Thanks again to our sponsors, teamstake.com and yourrules.com for sponsoring today's show. For Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening, and enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.